Hello everyone! I am deeply honoured, humbled and excited to receive the Santoria Award for my PhD research. I am sincerely grateful for the acknowledgement I have received for my work and I would like to thank the Centre for the Study of Medicine and the Body in the Renaissance and the awarding committee for this recognition. Now, winning this award would not have been possible without the inspiration and help that I have received from my family, friends, colleagues, and especially my three supervisors, Emma Sperry, Jim Seekert, and Nick Jardine. The award really serves as the best possible motivation for my further work. Now, the paper I am going to deliver today draws on one of the chapters from my dissertation, which is concerned with the communication of natural and medical knowledge between the Philippines and Europe at the turn of the 18th century. My PhD traces movements of knowledge from the point of local negotiations between indigenous people and European colonists to worldwide movements and receptions, as I seek to decenter previous narratives of the mobility of knowledge and recover the agencies of individuals and communities uh, previously regarded as peripheral. I demonstrate that input from local traditions and from agents across the socio-cultural spectrum were essential to the mobilization and production of knowledge, which was negotiated in complex cross-cultural situations. So by pluralizing the sites, agents and traditions involved, I point towards more inclusive geographies of early modern knowledge. In this talk specifically, I will focus on medical practices of the Jesuit pharmacist Georg Josef Kamel. In 1687, Kamel was sent as a missionary to the Philippines, then a colony under the Spanish flag. During his stay, he produced comprehensive treatises concerned with Philippine nature, in which he included episodes from his medical practice. I will use these sources to demonstrate how Kamel understood Philippine nature and incorporated local materia medica into European frameworks of knowledge. Previous work concerned with European encounters with new worlds has tended to highlight the desire of colonists for new profitable plants on the one hand and the insufficiency of old world remedies in the face of new realities on the other. Kamel's work offers a markedly different view. Although Kamel regularly adopted native materia medica into his medical practice, I argue that he understood these plants predominantly as substitutes for old world drugs, which were too expensive to import. Kamel interpreted Philippine plants predominantly through the lens of Galenic theory and canonical authors of the old world. In this way, he sought to Galenize Philippine plants that is, to incorporate them into the Galenic humoral framework and thus facilitate their circulation on both local and global scales and markets. I begin by introducing Kamel and his Philippine mission and then go on to explain how Kamel used Galenic theory to interpret local materia medica. In the second half of this paper, I will discuss the case of the St. Ignatius bean, a drug native to the Philippines. I will explore its Galenization, which enabled the Jesuits to commodify and globally market the bean. Although Kamel's methods facilitated the transit of certain local plants to Europe, some elements of his work were lost in translation between Manila and London. And to provide an example for such a disruption, I end by discussing Kamel's system of plant classification. Kamel was born in 1661 in Brno, in the present-day Czech Republic, where he was educated at the local Jesuit college. He entered the Society of Jesus in 1682 as a lay brother, before beginning his apprenticeship in pharmacy. He was trained in the Galenic tradition, and his understanding of medicine was humoral. In 1687, Kamel was listed among the Bohemian Jesuits selected for the Philippine mission. 
Upon his arrival in the Philippines, sometime between 1688 and 9, Camel was assigned to the Central Jesuit College in Manila and added the first Jesuit pharmacy in the Philippines to the college's establishments. In addition to working in his dispensary, Camel also saved the college the salary paid to the physician as he himself filled this position, in the words of the Jesuit historian of the Philippine province, Pedro Murillo Velarde. Camel's duties led him to explore local nature, the specimens of which he began to collect and document in order to identify resources which he could use in his practice. Promptly after his arrival, Camel established himself as a local colonial medical authority. The limited number of competitors in Manila acted in his favor. As he confessed to his compatriot Shimon Boruhradsky, who was stationed in Mexico, there is no physician here but four friars, who know little more than my pair of trousers. Under Camel's tenure, the Jesuit pharmacy became one of the most reputable colonial medical establishments in Manila, and his reputation soon spread beyond the Philippine Islands. By the late 1690s, Camel was engaged in a correspondence network which extended from New Spain across the Philippines to London, and his involvement in this network enabled Camel to deliver his reports of Philippine nature to London, where they appeared in print. Most of Camel's descriptions of Philippine plants were published as an appendix to the third volume of John Ney's Historia Plantarum, or The History of Plants, and the remainder of Camel's treatises came out in the Philosophical Transactions. A few drawings were also printed in James Pettiver's Periodicos, such as my favorite illustration, The Flying Cat Monkey. Camel's accounts shed light on the patients he treated and the drugs he employed. Camel commanded a broad clientele, which predominantly included his fellow Jesuit brothers, as well as crown officials and the poor, indigenes and slaves alike. In his treatments, Camel extensively relied on Materia Medica native to the Philippines. One of the local plants he claimed to have used regularly was Tanglot, a brush-like plant. Camel wrote that Tanglot stimulates the evacuation of urine, menses, fetuses, gas, watery edema and renal calculi, as well as acting as a laxative, as I have tried with four patients who were suffering from considerable constipation. Although Camel regularly drew on native substances, a closer look at his accounts reveals that he saw local materia medica predominantly through the prism of old world drugs and Galenic theory. He adopted Tanglat into his practice because he had previously identified it as a kind of squinanth, a plant recommended by the ancients against obstru obstructions of humors and other bodily products. This suggests that Camel combed local nature for, for plants related to those he already knew and which he could use as substitutes in the treatments he had learned at home. In this respect, Camel was drawing on a long pharmaceutical tradition of subsedanea or replacements or quid pro quo, literally this for that. <clears throat> this established practice was modeled on the treatise De Subsedaneis attributed to Galen, which provided practical lists of substances that could replace ingredients that were rare, expensive, or simply unavailable at the time of need. Early modern handbooks advised the sub that substitutes should agree in their virtues, nature, and characteristics, such as taste and smell. And indeed, Camel's associations were typically based on morphology, as in the case of Tanglot, often used in combination with sensory cues. For example, he believed that the herb Suganda smelled of, th of thyme and oregano and therefore used the herb as a substitute for the two plants. Therefore, Camel's investigations of local materia medica seemed not to be motivated by the hunger to discover new cures, 
so much as by the desire to find substitutes for those already known to him. It seems that Kamel explored his vicinity for locally available substitutes largely due to the high costs associated with importing drugs. As I discuss in my dissertation, the Royal Hospital of Manila, which was funded and administered by the Spanish Crown, received enormous consignments of old world remedies every year. In 1642 and 1717, which are two years for which complete inventories survive, the Royal Hospital received shipments of 1200 and 1500 kilograms of remedies, respectively. In 1717, the price of the drugs imported that year exceeded 10,000 pesos. To put that into perspective, the salary of the hospital's physician was in the region of a few hundred pesos per year. Compared to the crown, the funds available to the Jesuit Philippine province were considerably more modest. To finance their medical establishments, religious orders relied on combinations of donations from the local population and authorities, their own monastic coffers, and sponsorship from the crown, the so-called limosna de medicinas, or alms for medicine, literally. The amount annually dispensed to the Philippine Jesuits was a meager 150 pesos, about 1.5% of the sum that the crown spent on drugs for the royal hospital. And as the Jesuits constantly complained, the, this royal subsidy was hardly sufficient to secure adequate medical provisions, and the lengthy transportation created additional issues regarding preservation. In 1686, the Jesuit procurador Luis de, Mola de Morales lamented that, I quote, the medicines are of such bad quality that they are more likely to harm the patients, and hence the pharmacists fear administering them not to put in risk the health of those who at such a cost to your majesty have been brought to these missions. It was predominantly for this reason that Kamel turned to what local nature could offer. Since the importation of medicines was a pricey, lengthy and uncertain business, local substances were used out of necessity and primarily as substitutes for the rare, expensive or unavailable old world drugs. Galenism not only underpinned adherence to old world remedies, but it also offered a compelling framework for the understanding and adoption of plants from new worlds. Due to its flexibility, Galenism could be used to describe new realities and facilitate their, transla their translation into frameworks understandable to the Europeans. The efforts to Galenize local Materia America were intricately intertwined with the processes of appropriation and commodification. Indeed, new substances presented opportunities for financial profit. The engagements of the Society of Jesus in the drug trade have received particular attention, especially with respect to its involvement in the extraction and distribution of Sincona, which even earned the drug the moniker, the Jesuits' bark. The Philippines offer one additional example, the St. Ignatius Bean. Kamal's treatise on the bean, published in 1699 in the Philosophical Transactions, was the first comprehensive account of the bean printed in Europe. Locally called Igasur, the plant has been identified by modern botanists with Strychnos ignatii, a tree native to the Visayan Islands, where its seeds had been used in healing prior to the, to the European arrival. The eastern portion of the Visayas fell under the society's jurisdiction, and it was probably here that the Jesuits learned about the seed's powers. By rebranding Igasur as the beans of Saint Ignatius, the Jesuits sought to impose their authority and trademark upon the remedy. However, the adoption of Igasur and its reinvention as a legitimate drug first required that it was dissociated from non-European frameworks. Crucially for the Jesuits, 
there were spiritual concerns at play regarding the origins of local knowledge. In Spanish eyes, the Filipinos had been pagan prior to the European arrival. Therefore, Filipino knowledge was inherently regarded with suspicion, for its source and powers could well have been demonic. To place the source of the bean's virtues on safe foundations, the society framed its discovery as a fortuitous accident. In his treatise, Gamal recounted a captivating story of a Jesuit priest saved by the beans when a spiteful indigene attempted to poison him. It was casualité, or literally by chance, that the priest happened to have a dried bean on him, which was the first occasion that the Spaniards learned about the virtues and powers of Igasur. This chance discovery led to further investigations, the results of which Kamel subsequently recounted. To be accepted as a valid remedy and equipped for movement from its place of origin, the bean also had to be grounded in theoretical frameworks acknowledged as legitimate by the Europeans. It was through Galenization that the Jesuits sought to explain Igasur's uh, virtues in natural terms and embed the drug within a system familiar to European experts and customers. Based on its morphology, taste and other qualities, Kamel recognized Igasur as the nux vomica of the Arabian physician Serapion the Younger, whose work had been assimilated into the Galenic corpus centuries prior. Associations between local plants and canonical authorities appear throughout Kamel's work, and also the work of other Jesuit missionaries around the globe. By identifying local plants with those described by old world authors, the Jesuits downplayed the novelty of these plants and introduced them to European leaders in familiar guise. Moreover, by embedding plants of new worlds into schemes that were both ancient and familiar to Europe, the Jesuits could construct unified histories of the world that could be traced all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Therefore, by drawing parallels between nature and the people of Europe and of other worlds, the Jesuits highlighted the humanity of non-Europeans and their potential for conversion to Christianity. Now, to Galenize Igasur, Kamel had to demonstrate that it shared key properties with Nux Vomica. Serapion himself praised Nux Vomica for its emetic qualities, quote, it helps to vomit and sets humors in motion, making it easier for them to come out by vomiting. In addition to pointing to similarities in morphology, Kamel presented several cases from his medical practice, which clearly attested to the bean's emetic virtues. Based on the evidence gathered, Kamel concluded that the bean, quote, frequently tends to induce vomiting. He thus bolstered the Galenic associations he had drawn and presented the knowledge of the bean's virtues as emerging from Jesuit trials rather than as borrowed from local healing practices. Kamal's experiments also revealed some undesirable side effects. He reported that most of his patients suffered from violent seizures. To give an example, I once diluted one scruple of the powder of Igasur and gave it to Vicente Olsina, who was a fellow Jesuit, endowed with a melancholic constitution, to provoke regurgitation, as you would with uh, the Saint Ignatius Bean. He was troubled with indigestion, diarrhea, frequent nausea, sour belching, and copious flatulence. As soon as he took it, he was seized with a tremor of the whole body, which lasted for three hours, together with an itching and terrible convulsive twitching, so that he could not stand. It was strongest and most troublesome in his jaws, forcing him to a kind of laugh. He was having a seizure. Meanwhile, there was no notable alteration in the pulse, and there were no other subsequent symptoms. Afterwards, he felt somewhat better. Well, good for him, really.
Kamel ascribed these violent effects to the differences between indigenous and European bodies. Quote, in Spaniards, Igasur almost always causes spasmodic convulsions, but not in the indigenes. This observation was in line with Galenic theory, which posited that European and indigenous humoral constitutions, beard under very different climates, would differ, and hence react to the same substance in different ways. Camel's experiments with native materia medica therefore seems to be motivated partly by the desire to test its suitability for European humoral constitutions. Although European practitioners could adopt local materia medica as substitutes for old world remedies, this step presented risks for the unaccustomed colonists' bodies. So Camel's treatment of the Saint Ignatius bean suggests that to be redefined as a drug, the bean had to be stripped of its original cultural context and codified within European theoretical frameworks. Foreign substances were inherently regarded with skepticism, which was overcome through the testing and the contextualization of drugs into European frameworks. Through inscription into the Galenic corpus, local plants were turned into drugs and indigenous beliefs into legitimate knowledge. The reinvention of Igasur as a Galenic medicine paved the way for its deployment on both local and global scales and markets. And indeed, when browsing through 18th century European works of Materia Medica, there is only one drug native to the Philippines that appears regularly, the St. Ignatius Bean. And Camel Treatis, uh, Camel's treatise remains an authoritative source on the bean for the rest of the century. However, not all elements of Kamal's work were successfully transmitted from the Philippines into European contexts, and some were indeed lost in translation. One such example was Kamal's system of plant classification. Early modern attempts to systematize the plant kingdom commonly started with the division between herbs and trees. Although the philosophical limitations of this bipartite method were widely discussed, it was retained by most authors, including Camel's correspondent in London, John Ney. In Camel's classification of Philippine flora, he was clearly inspired by Ray's method, whose Historia Plantarum he, quote, saw a reference several years ago and considered a work supremely brilliant, for which all posterity will give you deserved credit. Camel used similar criteria of arrangement and directly borrowed many of Ray's classes, which would have facilitated the reception of Camel's work in Europe. But there was one exception, which distinguished Camel from Ray and also other botanists. In addition to herbs and trees, Camel resolved to add one further principal division, climbing plants or vines. To my knowledge, the decision to promote climbing plants into one of the main categories and thus create a tripartite scheme has no parallel in early modern European natural history. Camel never explained his decision to abandon the traditional dichotomy between herbs and trees, and therefore we can only speculate about his reasons. It is unlikely that Camel's inspiration came from Europe. So instead, I suggest we should look for answers in the local context. In the Philippines, Camel was confronted with an abundance of plants that did not fit comfortably into either of the two old world categories, such as lianas, a challenge that sedentary European scholars did not typically face. It was most probably to accommodate for such misfits that Camel resolved to devise a whole new category. Incidentally, Filipino folk taxonomies commonly include vines or climbing plants as one of the divisions, typically alongside herbs and woody plants. For example, the Tagalog people, with whom Kamel interacted most extensively, traditionally distinguish four main groups of plants, identical to those used by Kamel. Trees, shrubs, herbs and vines. Note that uh, Kamel grouped trees and shrubs into a single category. The Ifugao people in northern Luzon even use an identical tripartite system to the one used by Kamel. 
So this evidence raises the possibility that Kamel may have been drawing on local categories of knowledge in his classifications. However, when trying to publish his work in Europe, Kamel paid dearly for departing from the time-honored dichotomy between herbs and trees. Ray omitted Kamel's section on climbing planes from Historia and included only Kamel's descriptions of trees and herbs. The third additional group, which Kamel introduced based on his local experience, simply could not be reconciled with Ray's own system and with contemporary scholarly practice in Europe. The case of Kamel's classification system reveals how the work of a Jesuit stationed in Manila was shaped by that of a sedentary English naturalist, thus highlighting the early modern proliferation of links around the globe and their power to shape knowledge practices in geographically distant contexts. Kamel's category of climbing plants then illustrates how these global influences readily interacted and became entangled with local contingencies. Even if well suited for systematizing Philippine nature, however, this foreign group found little appreciation among sedentary European naturalists and became lost in translation between Manila and London. To briefly conclude, Kamal's medical practices indicate that European medical traditions proved flexible enough to accommodate for numerous plants native to the Philippines, which enabled Kamal to downplay their novelty and embed them within received European knowledge. For Kamal, ancient knowledge and authors represented essential instruments for understanding and appropriating Philippine nature. It was by recourse to the language of antiquity that Kamel was able to describe novelty. In his work, canonical authors and their plants, such as Serapian and Nux Vomica, feature essentially as dictionary categories, stripped of their contextual meaning and stabilized through centuries of tradition, they were fixed enough to mediate across different contexts. So ancient terminology provided a stable enough language in an increasingly fragmented Europe and offered a degree of continuity amid the early modern flood of names and objects. Through naming and assimilation into familiar schemes, European naturalists turned foreign plants into understandable entities. It was through incorporation into the Galenic corpus that Kamal turned local remedies into drugs and indigenous beliefs into legitimate knowledge. Through Galenization, Kamal paved the way for the introduction of Philippine plants as medicines on European markets. However, very importantly, at the heart of every attempt at appropriation lay the tricky question of commensurability. Although the St. Ignatius Bean was a success story for the Jesuits, reliance for identical strategies did not guarantee the successful transplantation of all Philippine flora. Kamal's treatment of Philippine Materia Medica suggests that he understood local nature primarily through the prism of old world theories, as he looked predominantly for substitutes for remedies already known to him. Therefore, this offers an interesting nuance to prevailing narratives of colonial bioprospecting and the European hunger for the so-called green gold. Not all European encounters with new substances were bioprospective, and colonial sites did not by default yield new drugs for European exploitation. The Saint Ignatius being presents the exception rather than the rule. In accordance with Galenic theory, the question of the bean's suitability for European bodies remained an obstacle to its adoption and first required verification through testing. As illustrated by the bean's violent effects on unaccustomed European bodies, foreign substances were in danger of being regarded with suspicion, which was overcome through their testing and decontextualization into European frameworks. Despite Kamal's efforts to efface local agencies and traje trajectories in this uh, case, uh, 
It is by covering these processes of translation that we as historians stand to gain insights into what cross-cultural knowledge encounters entailed. Thank you very much for listening.